Hello, everyone. I'm uh, pleased to join you with uh, join us today. Uh, have you join us today as we meet with faculty and discuss the fall plans for the school? And we're going to hear about courses. We're going to have people introduce themselves briefly. And one of the things I've come to appreciate in my time with the school and with the program, and that's over many years now, what an incredible community we have. And we're going to do our very best to create a fantastic community for our incoming students in the fall, along with the existing students who are currently in the program. So we'll hear about that as well. And of course, next week, uh, which is the uh, 15th of June, uh, we will be uh, have an open town hall. You'll have a chance to hear from us in person. But today's a chance to give you a little bit of insight in advance of that meeting. So to begin with, just to reiterate, I'm Wayne Caldwell, and I'm the coordinator for the Rural Planning and Development Program. And uh, the program consists of eight faculty, and we're going to hear from people today. And in addition to that, we have with us Lorena Barker, who is the uh, program assistant. And I'm sure many of you have already spoken to her in one way or the other. So maybe I'll begin with, I'm just going to follow my screen like this, and that tends to work well. I'm going to actually begin with Sarah Epp, who's in my bottom left corner. Sarah, how are you? I'm great, Wayne. Thanks for the invitation today. I think this is fantastic. So my name is Sarah Epp. I'm an assistant professor in the program and my research interests, if you haven't looked at it online, are around social planning and planning for agriculture and food systems. That's great. Thank you. And we're going to hear lots more from you, Sarah, but really a good point to point out the online materials because there's lots of content there for, uh, for incoming students to learn about all of us uh, in an individual matter. Uh, Lorena. Good morning. So I am Lorena Barker and uh, I am the graduate program assistant here at the, and I'm sure I've probably spoken to quite a few of you through email. So now it'll be great to see you face to face. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns in regards to the program, um, picking choices of, of courses or any forms that need to be um, filled out, I'd be more than happy to help you out. Thank you. And one of the things folks will come to appreciate with Lorena, she always has a big smile and is always very helpful. So thanks for that, Lorena. Uh, Dave. Oh, and Dave's going to put his, uh, turn off his mute there, aren't you, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dave Guyadine, and I'm an assistant prof in the Rural Planning and Development Program. Uh, some of the classes that I teach are on theory and evaluation, and my research interests generally um, are around evaluation and planning. So how do we assess the effectiveness of uh, planning policies? Thank you. That's great. And we're going to hear from Dave in a few moments about some of those courses, as people have the pleasure of having theory in the fall, which is always a fun course. So, uh, Leith. Hi everyone, uh, I'm also an assistant professor within RPD and I'm a former grad. I will be teaching all of you uh, methods. Uh, in the fall, my primary research interests are around community resiliency, sustainability, development, and rural planning. Thanks very much. Thank you, Leith. And again, I'll just note that a couple of our faculty are former graduates of the program, so they've, uh, they've lived through it all and uh, with good stories to tell, I'm sure. So, uh, Ryan. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Gibson. I'm an associate professor in the program and my background largely focuses on rural economic development, place-based development, um, some work around charities and wealth and looking at issues of governance. That's great. Thank you very much, Ryan. And again, you have experience from uh, Eastern Canada, I know, and Western Canada, Manitoba in particular, folks happen to come from those geographies and internationally as well. Uh, Sherry? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk with everyone today. Uh, my name is Sherry Longo. I'm faculty in rural planning and development. Uh, some of my research areas are around water resources, water governance, uh, water resource management, and I focus a lot of my research with Indigenous communities, myself having roots from Six Nations. Um, I teach Indigenous experiences and relations and watershed planning in the fall, and I look forward to seeing many of you hopefully in my class. That's great, thanks, Sherry. Just it's interesting to focus on watershed planning for a second because uh, you know the, the program in its various ways caters to very specific interests, of which watershed planning is one of them. And next, we'll hear from Nick Grenet, who does a lot of work in the environment too. And Nick's going to unmute his button in a second here as well. Why? I don't know why I do that all the time. Um, it's the nerves. It's the nerves around filming. 
Um, so I, my name is Nick Burnham. I'm an assistant professor in, um, in the same program, obviously. Uh, and I also uh, am the Laternal Professor in Environmental Stewardship. Um, my research generally focuses on environmental governance and all the tools to kind of operationalize that uh, at a community level. Um, and then I like to connect that to uh, resource-based community um, development, uh, focusing mostly on northern, um, quote unquote, more, more remote communities uh, in Canada and internationally. Um, I teach um, impact assessment and uh, your, your favorite quantitative techniques class and, um, and, a, and a couple others that I can talk about later. That's great. Thank you, Nick. And again, just mentioning uh, the Laternal, as you did, is again, one of the organizations of many that we have strong partnerships out there uh, across the province and uh, within Canada and internationally as well. So uh, thank you for that, Nick. And the next to uh, Sylvia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity, Wayne. My name is Sylvia Sarapura. I am also an assistant professor in the Rural Planning and Development Program. And I teach uh, the courses in the international stream, four courses, and my research interest is basically in the intersectional feminist and gender planning for agricultural and rural development. That's great. Thank you, Sylvia. And again, just uh, mentioning contacts as we were in the previous one, all the international contacts you have that people will be interested to learn from and to build upon as well. I must say how impressed I w was with all of the faculty, your ability to be really short with those introductions, because certainly uh, potential students can go online and read more about each of us uh, to get further detailed, because we really want to focus today on what the fall is going to be like. And to start that discussion, I'm just going to open it up and I'll invite the faculty to talk about the one or two courses that you're teaching in the fall and uh, something you might find interesting or that students might find interesting about those courses. Uh, so somebody just want to volunteer to go first. Yeah, uh, Sherry. And again, we'll remember to unmute our microphone. And here I'm laughing at others. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say too that people can also um, feel free to like reach out for specific questions while we're just sort of touching on things. Don't be afraid to email. Um, we always got time for a quick email or Zoom call or uh, to go over any specific questions. But um, in, so in my classes, so um, I've come to RPD relatively recently, four years ago. And prior to that, I've been working in Indigenous communities. Um, so I consider myself a bit more of a practitioner. And um, in that, I bring those experiences to my teaching and I bring those experiences to my classes. So, for example, I teach Indigenous community planning in the fall. Um, and I bring to that course, which I think is quite interesting and exciting, is the practical sense, where we're able to really look at real world issues that are current, that are active, um, that you can turn on the news to say, how do I begin looking at this? And how, how do I begin understanding the complexity of some of these issues? And then how does this relate to me as a practical planner, a developer within a community? Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. And then students are, are encouraged to bring their interest to the class as well. We discuss and we share and we learn it. Um, to learn from one another and to see things very differently in the complexities that you will encounter going into your practice. That if you're going into planning and development, you will be working with Indigenous communities or peoples in some fashion. And that's really my role here, I feel, um, from that line of, in terms of my teaching to provide those insights. While some of my research transcends Indigenous planning, sustainability, community development, I do focus more on water resources as, as a focus, but certainly some of the work goes on food sovereignty and food security, social planning, um, development, consultation, so lots of topics. So that probably is one of the elements I think is exciting about my classes. We do cover a lot. Well, you'll go into other classes and you may focus on one area. We get to do a lot and explore that. And then it leads on to, if you're really interested in it, into Indigenous community planning, in the winter term, will we build upon those foundational knowledges and in, in, in an ideal situation, uh, I line up students with communities where we do some practical um, applications of some of that knowledge. So I think it's exciting. We use a little bit of humor and fun and really um, use that as an opportunity to explore some of those questions we might have and don't have an avenue to explore them. This is the place to do it. And I can connect you some of my former students that say they really enjoy the class and uh, take a lot from it. So I see that as a foundation to other classes as well. So that's why I wanted to go first, but thanks. 
That's great, that's great Sherry, because one thing people will hear is that everyone has lots of practical components to it, so it's really good to bring a, an initial focus to that for sure. And the two specific courses, are, is it one or two specific courses? Just remind me in the fall that you have, Sherry. Oh, yeah, yeah. thank you. I teach the graduate um, Indigenous Experiences and Relations in an yeah. online graduate watershed planning practice, and then in the winter, Indigenous Community Planning for RPD and Water Resource Management for RPD. That's great. And then folks, I think are already aware of the students that uh, we will be teaching everything in the fall online in, in a variety of formats. And that's what we're going to really uh, work hard to, uh, to make that as engaging as possible. Um, someone else like to go next. Uh, Nick. Hey, everyone. Um, so I forgot to mention that I'm like, like Leith, I'm also a graduate of um, our program. Um, and um, you know, I think that we, we often don't think of, of that when you're entering a rural planning and development program, but I actually um, left and, and worked mostly in impact assessment, um, which, you know, we, we do have a number of students. Uh, I can think of a couple off the top of my head that graduated in the last couple of years that ended up with jobs in engineering firms and other types of firms that are working in impact assessment leading me to my fall class. Um, so the, um, I've been teaching environmental impact assessment for three years. Um, it has changed a lot from uh, a very federal focus to somewhere in between Ontario and federal um, as we navigated all the changes in the federal process over the last couple of years. It's been a bit challenging. Um, but, so, so, but one thing hasn't changed is that there's a strong focus on practice so uh, this year, uh, I'm going to try to do a, a somewhere in between a what we call synchronous and asynchronous, meaning that there's going to be um, some uh, recorded lecture material, short lectures combined with uh, at least biweekly discussions with practitioners online that will be live or recorded, depending, um, combined with multiple, I'd say, shorter assignments. And so it really be kind of like a hybrid course, um, hoping to still have that strong, a bit like Sherry, that strong connection to professional practice, given that it is a very practice-driven course. Um, and I've already booked a couple of guest lectures for the fall, so um, so that's already that's pretty good. And uh, beyond that, uh, do we are we speaking about the winter? Oh, I think if we just uh, just mention quickly the, the courses you're teaching in the winter, sure, but the okay. most part we'll focus on the yeah, fall. Yeah, and so in the winter, we don't really know what we're doing yet, but I'll be teaching uh, climate, uh, sorry, <laughs> disaster management in the in the winter, as well as, uh, which will be online, as well as um, a course called Quantitative Techniques, which really builds off of Leith's uh, methods course. So it's a bit of a methods 2.0 course where we dive into techniques uh, to kind of uh, move our proposals forward and hopefully have a, a, uh, a well-designed proposal by the end uh, of April. That sounds great. And uh, certainly we, you know, we, we know what courses will be offered in the fall. We'll just be working through the, the format for delivery depending on how the fall unfolds for sure. So, uh, well, why don't, why don't I go next? I got a couple of courses in the fall. And um, I should mention that uh, sort of the 20, 25 years of experience I've had working with municipalities is integrated into my courses. I'll be doing two in the fall, one of which is healthy rural and small town communities. And that course will be delivered for the third time. So we've been through any, uh, any learning process with that. And I will mention that most of that content, if people want to have a look in advance, is online at ruralhealthycommunities.ca. And it consists of lots of interviews with uh, practitioners and uh, and uh, medical officers of health and uh, planners as well. So I think people will find that to be of interest. And the second course I'll be teaching in the fall is foundations. And that course has ran for many years. And uh, in the past, we've always done field excursions and so on. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna promise to do at least eight to 10 videos of rural and small town communities and bring some dialogue to that that'll hopefully bring those uh, communities into the classroom uh, in the fall. So those will be the two courses I'll be doing in the fall. Uh, Someone else now ready to go. Just uh, yes. I'm, uh, Sylvia. <laughs> yes, thank you, Wayne. Yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, uh, I teach the four courses in the international stream, and mm -hmm. these courses are approach um, based on the experience and the experience that I build uh, in international uh, agricultural 
research for development uh, field. I used to work for different organizations in different countries. And what I bring to the classroom is um, strong practice, but built on theory. Because working as an international practitioner, you need to know what is happening, what has happened in the past in order to uh, influence policies, legal frameworks in relation to international rural uh, planning and development. We all know that, um, and for a reason I uh, stress out the importance of the intersectional feminist and gender approach because what I want my students is to know that um, rural populations in developing countries are very diverse and uh, I approach feminism because we need to know what uh, are the experiences of women in different contexts and, and in different groups. Um, I approach it also from the perspective of international experts. And now uh, because of COVID, uh, our classes are going to count with experts from different organizations worldwide. Uh, for people working in Latin America, for example, for REMIS, which is a, a, a research uh, organization in Latin America from FAO, from a NGOs, and, and also linking and trying to get closer to the courses that uh, other faculty teach, because I think, and I always mention that all the courses that we have in rural planning are going to be complemented and, and will complement with the learning that you have uh, in the international stream. It's also to acknowledge, isn't it, Sylvia, our graduates that are around the world that are doing international work that have graduated through the international stream and, uh, and to integrate those as best as we can, isn't it? Yes. Yes, uh, Wayne. And, and well, I am an example of, of, of a graduate from the University of Wealth. Uh, I have studies in agronomy. I did my studies in Peru, but all my knowledge and experience was built in the University of Wealth during my master's and my PhD studies. Thank you for that. Um, Leith, are you ready to go there? <clears throat> yep. Um, so as I mentioned, I teach the Rural Research Methods, which is a mandatory class for everybody. Um, it is Tuesdays. Uh, I guess the schedule says Tuesdays, I think 8.30 to 11.20, which I mean, much like Nick said, it's a bit of a flexible schedule at this time. So I'm trying to figure out the best way forward. It'll be some sort of hybrid of pre-recorded lectures, uh, direct, you know, live lectures. Um, I'll do everything that I can to make it as interesting as possible. Uh, I really, really like research methods. I've taught it several times over the last eight years or something. Um, I find methods really interesting because without a good methodological framework, no research is really possible. Uh, of course, the challenge in our program is that roughly a third of you are uh, course-based students, a third are major research paper-based, and a third are thesis-based. So coming into a methods class, Part of the difficulty is trying to get everybody on board for the utility and the, the you know, the importance of methods. Um, I assure you, for those of you that are looking at becoming community planners and maybe don't understand or don't think research methods are important, we spend a ton of time talking about communications and uh, knowledge mobilization and transparency. And as you enter into the workforce as planners, you're going to realize that a very, very significant portion of your day is going to be spent dealing with the public. And in order to do that, you have to understand how to get your point across, how to be unbiased, how to be you know, confident in all the different aspects. You have to be able to conduct surveys and interviews and focus groups, everything that you need to, to do as a planner, we kind of cover in, in the course. So basically uh, the course is broken down into sections. The first methodological section we talk about is quantitative. We look at surveys in particular. So in the past, I've had students go out to conduct, to develop surveys and then to go out and conduct them on campus. We get an ethics protocol for class. Uh, and then we do an analysis, just a basic descriptive stats analysis of it. Nothing, nothing super crazy or scary. And then we use the data from that to inform an interview guide, a qualitative guide. And then you go out and you conduct the interviews. And then we do a qualitative uh, thematic analysis using in vivo. 
Uh, this year, of course, it's all going to be a little bit different. So the delivery is going to be virtual. So you'll do surveys delivered virtually online, and then we can do an analysis using Qualtrics. And then the survey or the interviews can be done using Zoom or some other platform, but we'll still go through all the same stuff. It'll all be, you know, face to face, of course, virtually. Um, everyone will have experience to gather, uh, gather data and analyze data. And most important to understand the utility of data analysis and data gathering. And the idea is at the end of it, you're, you're kind of set to go into next class. You have a better idea of what research methods are. Uh, some of you don't come from a, a research undergrad, so it's important to understand the utility. And so when you go into next class, you know what a research proposal is, why you're doing it, and why it's important. In addition to that, I teach another class, Environment and Development. It's not a mandatory class, so uh, it's delivered online, has lots of online activities. It's always been an online class, so I'll do that the same way as it's always been done. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Leith. And as you're just uh, reflecting there, I'm, and again, it's for folks that might not be in the, uh, the, the thesis stream as an example, or even the major research paper, and, I, and I'm reflecting as a practitioner, things like housing studies and septic tank studies, right? And hiring consultants to do research on our behalf and how important it is to have a really found, sound foundation in research methods for those kinds of activities, notwithstanding the research that might happen to the university environment. So thank you for that and bringing focus to it. Uh, so I think there's three people yet to hear from uh, uh, Dave or Dave, do you want to go next? Yeah, I can start. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, I teach the planning theory class, which is in the fall. And um, I have the, I'm seeing all of you in that fall class. Um, what I've done is I have a practice based experience uh, or a practical lens, and I try to apply that in the planning theories class. So uh, try not to make it as a, a dry kind of class. Um, some of the things that are, are, I'm trying to do to engage the class is we're going to look at a variety of topics. So we're going to look at planning. What is planning? Challenge some of the ideas about planning. Uh, we start a discussion from the Industrial Revolution and look at kind of the external forces that led to the creation of planning and reflect on planning today. So in the COVID-19 situation, for example, we're going to look at how that's going to change the course of planning and how it's going to affect planning theory. Um, I also talk about topics related to the dark side of planning, or if you're a Stranger Things fan, uh, planning's upside down. So we're looking at how planning has been used in ways that may have not been beneficial to society. So we're really looking at the full spectrum of planning. Um, so I'm hoping that you're gonna get it, you're gonna find the class engaging. I've created these small group discussions where we're really going to challenge um, some of the core underlying principles of planning to make it really enjoyable. Um, and I'll talk about the, fall, the summer classes, um, I think at a later date, but that's it. That's great, thank you for that, Dave. I'll, uh, I think folks can look forward to theory and, uh, and that practical approach to it that you bring. I'll just continue this. Uh, Sarah, why don't you go next? Perfect. Thanks, Wayne. Um, so I will be teaching a social planning course this fall. I teach a PhD course as well. The social planning course is an elective, so you aren't required to be there. So I won't see that many of you, I'm sure, in the fall semester. Uh, it's kind of a fun class, in my opinion, because we get to look at those who planning tends to forget. So we bring a variety of different lenses of what the public interest is, who's the public, and the multiple interests that tend to compete. Uh, we look at new immigrants. We'll look at some gender topics. Uh, definitely bring in some of the current political climate, I think, that's happening right now because it's really important. And also look at how planning may have influenced some of those pieces. There's some really interesting historical underlying components to that from a planning perspective. It'll all be online. It'll be discussion-based and it will hopefully be very, very personal and you'll enjoy it as much as I do. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. And, and just to reflect on how important it is to bring a rural lens to those kinds of issues, which is the case for all of our courses, right? It's that, that rural lens and the specific needs of, of rural populations and rural people. So thank you for that. Ryan, I think you're the last one to hear back on this topic. Yeah, so I actually don't have any courses in the RPD program that I teach this fall. Um, so I won't have an opportunity to meet um, all the incoming students in the class. Um, I will, however, teach in the winter semester the economic development course, uh, which really focuses around rural economic development strategies, approaches, and theories that are utilized both here in Canada, but also internationally. And we'll bridge in a whole bunch of rural economic development practitioners and policymakers. Uh, and build on some of the research that's ongoing around different approaches to local economic development um, across Canada, across the European Union, as well as into Latin America. Um, and historically, we've always worked with 
groups uh, like the Ontario Good Roads Association to connect with mayors and elected officials to, to work on regional development strategies and, and we'll probably continue to do that in the winter semester. Uh, but over the fall semester, as I said, I don't teach any courses, um, but please don't hesitate to contact me at any time. Delighted to find out what people are up to, what you're interested in, and if I can be of value, don't hesitate to reach out. That's great. Thank you, Ryan. And that's a good reminder for ourselves and for uh, students coming to the program as well, that faculty teach in a variety of areas. The vast, vast majority of the faculty, uh, faculty teach uh, almost exclusively into the rural planning and development program. But we have uh, 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 two or three courses that, that are taught by faculty into various undergraduate programs and two or three courses that are also taught by faculty into the PhD program, which uh, is, again, an important contributor to, uh, to what our school is about. So. So with that, let me take us to the third item for discussion. And this is a bit of a brainstorm uh, because one of the things, as I mentioned at the outset, that we've always been, I think that we've done a really good job with as a program and as a school is created a, as, as, a, as contributed along with their student body to a sense of community. And this is something that as students that you need to take on in the fall as you come into the program, but it's equally something that we'll be aiming to do this, uh, this coming fall as well, doing what we can to help ensure that, that sense of community that's always been such an important component of the, the program is still front and center. So I'm just gonna open it up and uh, invite people to jump in with uh, specific items or new items that we might not have even talked about, things that, that you might be doing or think that we could do uh, along that line. And uh, so I'll just, with that, I'll um, invite people to open their microphones and speak in. I might start off if that's okay and just talk about the GSS really quickly. One thing I think every grad student in our program comes to realize really, really fast is there's a ton of acronyms and you may or may not remember all of them. Uh, the GSS is the Graduate Student Society. It is made up of graduate students uh, within CEDRID. So it'll be students in rural planning and development, capacity development and extension, PhD program and landscape architecture. It's traditionally been about creating sort of a social environment where students feel very connected. They host a number of activities over the year in person. Right now they're brainstorming ideas of how to build that community and have those events online and so stay tuned they'll send emails there's a Facebook group as well uh, dedicated to the GSS that really does look at those opportunities to really bring faculty into some of the events as well as alumni and a whole host of other pieces and one other one that you should consider is the OAC's Graduate Student Council or the OAC GSC they always look for graduate students to be members of the council it looks great on a resume and they also help to build a sense of community across all of the different schools within the college so keep an eye on your inbox. You'll definitely see emails coming from students regarding that and great ways to build community both within the school and then across the campus. What are two or three specific things, specific things, Sarah, that the GSS did last year? I'm thinking of the rural romp as an example. So the rural romp is led by RPD students. So this is an annual event that rural planning students put together to showcase what rural planning is. It usually includes some field trips, guest speakers, and that usually happens in late March. Um, some of the GSS activities that were arranged, they did a Halloween movie night. They tend to do activities that children would love and you feel okay doing it if you're around other adults. So pumpkin carving, gingerbread building contests, um, trivia at the grad lounge. Lots of things were in person. There were events like a bowling event where you were welcome if you had a partner or children to bring them as well and the, the GSS covered the cost of that. Lots of in-person opportunities last year that were hosted and so now switching that to online but really about building that sense of community and lots of different aspects to totally appeal to different people. Because I fully expect the GSS to be as active this coming year as it has always been in terms of doing, uh, doing things for, the, for students within the program. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, someone else to jump in with an idea or, or, or an item? Another one that we have on the go that's done not only for the Rural Planning and Development Program, but for the entire School of Environmental Design and Rural Development is the Speaker Series. And this is a series that takes place about every other week. Um, and over the past year, we did a number of them actually delivered online already. Um, so we'll continue to do that throughout the fall and winter semesters. And the Speaker Series is very much an informal opportunity to, to hear new perspectives around rural planning and development. It's an opportunity to hear about some of the research that's being done by your fellow students, but also some faculty. But we also pull upon alumni, guests from across province, across the country, um, to share different ideas that maybe you haven't been exposed to in some of the courses or maybe in a different way than what you were exposed to in the courses. 
And the speaker series is a really great opportunity um, to just gather that new information, to hear about new things, um, to understand different research methods that might be utilized, um, but also thinking about it from your own kind of professional aspirations around how that might um, be might have some implications for what you would like to pursue, whether that's working in a land use planning office in a consulting firm in government policy or whatever the field might happen to be. Um, so everybody will receive uh, email updates around when those are, are taking place, how to join them. Uh, and you can do that from anywhere in the world. And I know in the past, uh, Ryan, you've always been open to suggestions from people too. So if someone has a, an aunt or an uncle or, or someone else that would be a fantastic contributor to our program or, or someone else they just know professionally or aware of, we'd be more than happy, I'm sure, to hear about that. Absolutely. There's a small committee that starts to work around planning that and any ideas are always welcomed. People are also welcome to join that committee. It's not a committee. It's a committee that's composed of faculty, staff and students. Good stuff. Just as you're mentioning that, something I'll just uh, mention is, is, of course, faculty meet regularly uh, at, at faculty meetings, as you might expect, program committee meetings. And we always have a couple of students party to that. So we'll be sure to continue that in the fall as well. Um, someone else like to jump in with a suggestion of things that might happen in the fall. Uh, Sylvia? Yes. Um, well, we have built uh, a strategy for the international stream. And we are uh, paying attention to this. And, and in this semester, what we will do is concentrate in two activities, the mentoring part. Uh, and we will be continuing um, connecting students with international practitioners and researchers according to the um, research or practitioner uh, interest of, of the student. And it is a way to help them to settle down in, in university and in our program. And the other one is we will continue uh, inviting international guests and also organizing activities. For example, last, uh, last year with the support from all faculty from RPD, we uh, had a meeting with uh, IFAD uh, uh, directors from Rome and it was organized by Global Affairs Canada, but we supported this activity. And we will encourage you to, to be part of this and to be part of the organizing committee so you engage with other students and with the uh, guest speakers or guests. Thank you for that, Sylvia. I was just going to build on that too. I know that uh, RPD students have played a real leadership role as well with an international organization on campus, which has continued in the past. And I'm anticipating that will continue, of course, into the future. And uh, because the students who were in first year will be here in second year and still playing a leadership role in that area. Yes, Gwen, and thank you for reminding me. Um, um, we are collaborating with the uh, Wealth Institute of Development Studies and the program in international development studies. And uh, one of our students is the leader of the graduate uh, student association, Angela uh, Asuncion. And we also want to uh, see you um, taking some leader, leadership roles in this association and in our program. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, other folks, and I, I certainly know, I see Nick and Sherry's uh, speakers both came off at the same time. So uh, Sherry, why don't you go first? Oh yeah, it just it's something that we've all sort of talked about is to build on what Sylvia had mentioned, uh, this, this uh, approach to mentoring, mm -hmm. either within our research labs, we're having regular research lab meetings um, with colleagues that may be in the same year as you, or maybe in a second year. Uh, it's something that we try, I know myself and others do as well. Um, and as well, I try to link and with something that I'm sure we're, we're all doing or we can think of as a program to some of our students with our graduates. Um, those that have recently graduated have gone through the experience of the program because they're usually really happy to give back and give some insight and can give a different perspective and just feel um, that's or give an opportunity for students to connect with someone that's went through the experience and even gone through the hiring and um, as we know, many of our students are already hired once they're completed. So it's really important for that as well, because it's yet another sort of linkage to the program, both historically and to learn from, from others. So we can facilitate that too, um, as just yet another way of connecting people beyond some of these other activities. So there's lots of options. And I also suggest, as, as you mentioned, uh, Wayne, to support that if there's suggestions that the, that the students have or incoming saying this, these are some things that 
we've seen or experienced elsewhere that might be of interest or really interested to do or want to take a leadership role in uh, coordinating some of those activities or support available and we'd be happy uh, to support those student-led initiatives because often those are just as strong and uh, just as effective as anything we could do or if not more effective at times. That's a great comment, Sherry. If folks have already listened to the students, incoming students have listened to the video with the alumni that we recorded, you'll recall everyone more than welcome or more than uh, willing to help out in, in however they might. And certainly the opportunity to build some mentoring, uh, buddy kinds of relationships, with those uh, existing alumni of which there are, I think there are seven, 800 alumni of the program out there, uh, more than willing uh, to always help. So that's, that's a great comment. Thank you for that. Uh, Nick, did you have something to say there? I, I, again, I saw your microphone go off. Um, yeah. Um, well, so, so every year we there is a Laternal Symposium. Um, it was cancelled prior to the pandemic um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, it was always at last year was tremendously popular with students, and it had it was incredible. And I think we had so much fun. I know Wayne, uh, Sherry, you were there, and I think others might have been there as well, but. Uh, we had a really good time, uh, and I, I felt it was pretty sad to lose that. So I have already bugged Leith, um, but I'm I'm pushing uh, the steering committee, which is a committee that that uh, runs the Eternal Symposium every year, to uh, be supportive of the idea of a student uh, Eternal Conservation kind of day. Um, only issue is format, and try I'm trying to be a little more innovative. Um, so this is something that I've, I've been reflecting on, but we're looking at trying to have a, a student uh, Laternal Conservation Symposium sometime around late November, which is when the Laternal um, Symposium would have uh, typically occurred. Um, and so that's something that I'll be uh, putting out emails, feelers, and it might be great to have some students involved in organizing it. Uh, as well. Um, you know, I don't always know what's the best technology to use as well and what's the most interesting. So um, looking at, at some, some fun things there to keep that continuity and to get you engaged on uh, about conservation, uh, conversations about conservation and planning um, and, and connecting with the professional world of conservation practice uh, in Southern Ontario. Um, so that's something I'm hoping will happen in the late fall. That's a, a great comment there, Nick. And it, it, it takes me to think about the other conferences that are happening out and the potential to build community within those because there's multiple conferences and Laternal is a fantastic one. And the opportunity to, uh, you know, for some of these, there may even yet be opportunities to submit abstracts. And if not for this coming fall, uh, in the fall for subsequent offerings. And that's something you can do with other students. Again, another fantastic way to build community. Um, Leith or Dave, anything you're wanting to add to this? Yeah, but, uh, building off of Nick's comment too as well, um, and Wayne, we talked about um, these professional organizations. There's also the OPPI conference, which uh, we're, we're very active with. Um, it's in, in October. And um, I believe we've just received a notice saying that the conference is going online for, for the, the October um, session. Uh, but it's a great way to connect with professionals, um, get to see what's going on in the, in the practicing world. And um, generally our students present at the conferences as well. So it might be an opportunity to present, if not at this one, the following year. Um, and we also have connections with the Canadian Institute of Plan um, Canadian Evaluation Society. Um, so one of that is promoting the CES or Canadian Evaluation Society, attending the conferences and participating in some of the, um, the, the, the um, competitions that they have. That's great. Uh, again, those competitions I know are, uh, are intense, but fantastic learning opportunities for half a dozen students or so at a time. So that, that's good. Uh, Lee. Uh, yeah, sorry, my dog is running around. Uh, yeah, a couple other things that you should be aware of. Um, we have a, and you will hear about it if you haven't already, we have a very close relationship with OMAFRA, so the Ontario Ministry of Agricultural, uh, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, you'll hear their name tons and tons. So there's, um, I'm not actually sure of what it's officially called, but like the Rural Symposium, is that right, maybe? Uh, in the winter, that is a direct, um, event between CEDRED and, and OMAFRA. Uh, also, there's the Canadian Rural Revitalization uh, Federation that Ryan is nodding because he's heavily involved in. And the other thing that you should all be aware of is uh, there's a number of scholarships and mm -hmm. funding opportunities that come out. Uh, big ones that you probably have heard of are the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, um, the SHRC 
scholarships, um, HQP scholarships. Um, I'm sure there's a million others, but anytime you have uh, anything come across your desk that you think you might be qualified for, run it by whoever your direct supervisor is or any faculty member for that matter. And the other thing that you should probably keep in mind is that we're just one small department on campus and between the nine of us or the entire school, we have quite a few relationships across campus. So if there is a faculty member in geography, for example, run it by Ryan, there's a good chance you might know somebody over there. Or if there's someone over in international development, ask Sylvia. We have a lot of contacts across campus and don't forget, Wayne has been on campus for quite a long time. So if direct faculty member, the rest of us don't know, Wayne guaranteed he knows, he knows everybody on campus. So if there's someone that is doing interesting research that you want on your committee, or if you just have a question, chances are we can do an introduction for you as well. That's a great comment. Thank you, Elise, for that. Uh, Lorena, just wondering if there's anything that you want to add to this discussion at all. And uh, again, you all want, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I don't have anything really to add to this. Um, looking forward to meeting everybody on Thursday next week, or is it Thursday? No, Monday, the 15th. Yeah. Great, thank you. But I, what I would add on your behalf, though, is, is, is for me, it's the friendliness which you bring to the task is so important in terms of creating community, right? Because it's about people feeling welcome and invited. Yes. And, and I just think that's so incredibly important. Just as I notice the faculty, I know sometimes people are too busy to have their doors open, but most of the time, faculty are in their office, the doors are open and they're happy to chat to you, notwithstanding there are times when they're, when they're too busy. But I see the same thing happening with, uh, uh, with electronic means of communication, email and so on. People are really good about getting back to you and you shouldn't be shy to reach out to people. And that also helps uh, build uh, build community. Uh, there are a couple of things I'll also mention. We have been doing town halls with all of our students since uh, mid-March. And we've done those every two weeks uh, since then. And I'm certain that we'll, we will continue that in the fall because I think it's just a great uh, opportunity to have people ask questions directly and get immediate answers, but to have input and feedback and simply to talk to other people and, and, and learn from them in terms of what they are doing. So we will continue that in the fall. And I know several of you have volu volunteered to sit on a committee, oh, and I'm gonna call it the Social Convener Committee. And, uh, and, and, it, and we're still figuring out what that task, what that might look like. But again, it's about making sure that we have a strong sense of community in the fall. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that or offer any, any comments beyond what I've already said. And if microphones don't get unmuted, uh, right, there you go, Nick. I, I know I, I reflected a bit on it and I'm still, I think that it's gonna be a, an interesting conversation to have, uh, but it feels like it's also just about um, taking all of this and doing a bit like what I think Dave had done in the past, but creating a bit of a calendar, uh, coordinating these things uh, because it can be kind of overwhelming even for faculty to know everything that's going on. And um, I feel like I, I see a bit of that role as well as just being that um, yeah bringing it together in something that that can be easily used by students and they can set up alerts or whatever uh, I think that might even be helpful so I think that's uh, that's a great comment it's about being intentional right in the in the past things happen and you, you know just you don't have to do much they just they just happen but I think in the fall we're going to be in, in intentionally intentional about making sure that things do happen and that we help do what we can as faculty to bring a leadership role to that. Folks, we're about to adjourn, but I'm gonna give anybody a final opportunity if there's anything you want to add to any of this discussion, something that might've occurred or hasn't been otherwise mentioned. Anyone have something to say? And I'll just look for unmuted microphones. All right. I think one of the interesting things that we haven't chatted about yet is that this fall marks the 40th anniversary of the Rural Planning and Development Program. So all students that are entering are actually going to be in the 40th cohort of the program. Uh, and that's a really exciting time. And there'll be a number of initiatives that will allow us to reconnect with alumni that everybody will be invited to participate in. And you'll see that just the incredible diversity of where people have taken their rural planning development degrees, what they're doing with them, uh, and a wonderful network to, to have in your back pocket to connect with. That's, uh, that's a great uh, comment to reflect on and something to celebrate as, as we will in the fall. And we'll look forward to some interesting things happening that, uh, that contribute to that discussion. Anyone else? Okay, well, if not, I'd like to uh, move to adjourn our meeting, but first to thank uh, Lorena for all of the work that she does and has brought to uh, all of the tasks that happen around the school and to thank faculty for your willingness to uh, be here. Uh, for me, it's just been amazing over the last three months, I guess now, 
in terms of watching faculty's contributions. Everybody attends the town hall meetings if they possibly can. It's just a real commitment and dedication on, the, on behalf of everyone uh, to make sure that we deliver the best we possibly can. And I certainly know that we all expect the same of ourselves in the fall and that uh, we will certainly reach out to you as students and we will reach out to the program to make sure that the, the excellence that has been uh, the hallmark of the program for 40 years now uh, will we'll continue uh, for the next 40 years as well. So with that, I want to thank the students for listening to this video. I want to thank you for listening to the other two videos we've created with existing students and with alumni. And I uh, look forward to hearing many of you next uh, next week, which I should say is June 15th. So if you're listening to this afterwards, this, uh, this video will still be uh, valid. Uh, but more than that, we look forward to seeing you in September. All the best, everyone. Everybody's waving at you goodbye, by the way. <laughs>